Yay! <laughs> Yay. We did it, Steve. All right. <laughs> oh my goodness. You need to well turn done. your camera. You're upside down now. I'm upside down. How about there that? There we go. Now All you're right. right up. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, so sorry. Oh, no. Just a little bit. That's okay, Steve. I'm just happy yeah. that you're here with us. And I was telling everyone about your incredible um, book and author of this book and how I found you. And I found you by um, going into a random store in San Diego, um, trying to buy some art supplies. And um, they had um, books there, and I happened to gravitate to this one, and I loved every single page. I was reading it. I stayed for an hour reading your book inside the store, and uh, you inspired me so much. So I ended up buying the book, and, um, and then at the end, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to email him. Why not? And that's how our relationship started. I um, applied to one of your workshops. And since I've done so many with you and I have grown so much because of your guidance, your mentorship, your incredible knowledge in abstract expressionism and non-objective art, you've made me a better artist, a better person. Um, you have inspired so many people in the artist community. And um, I take my hat off for you because really you are unique in what you do and you are a true maestro so thank you for that so well, thank you for the kind words <laughs> so tell us a little bit about um tell us a little bit about you steve who are you who am i um well i was born in a uh um semi-affluent suburb of new york uh very conservative area um, and, uh, never felt like I belonged there. <clears throat> and as soon as I got old enough to, and got out of college, I moved straight to Manhattan, uh, and began a new life. I felt like I fit there. Um, so, um, uh, I met some artists when I were, was there and they were, uh, very, very helpful to me, very encouraging because I hadn't, uh, really done much art before. <clears throat> And I was working at a job uh, in advertising, doing advertising art, and uh, I was laid off. And so I figured, you know what, this life isn't for me. And I could go into this in much more depth, but I, this life wasn't for me. So I went to the Art Students League and began to draw from the figure every day. Uh, and when the unemployment ran out, I got a job as, as a waiter and then as a bartender and never looked back. Um, so I drew from the figure for over three years, all day, every day. Um, and then I decided it was time to uh, stop that and begin to paint. And I began painting with pastels uh, f from life, mainly still life. Uh, <clears throat> and things went from there. I began doing oil painting next, uh, mainly landscapes, and a dealer named Catherine Markell came to a show that I had a painting in and she had gone to that show to see the work of someone else but she saw mine and she bought it and then she asked me to be in her stable of artists <clears throat> and so I, I sold really really well for a few years and then my work began to be more abstract uh, less specific about the landscape and the work began to be harder and harder for her to sell uh, and after a while, uh, we ended uh, the link between the two of us. I've seen her many, many times since, and she always says to me, if you paint me some more Steve Imonies, I'll sell them. Uh, and she'll call me again and say, have you returned to the landscape yet? And I'll tell her no. Um, and I actually tried to a few times. And the exploratory energy that I went into landscape painting with at first was deadened. So even though I could make the paintings look pretty much like the old paintings that she used to sell, they lacked something. And in the process of making them, I lacked something. And uh, long story short, I was trying to paint these landscapes again uh, in Buford, South Carolina. My dealer sent me there. Um, 
paid me to go there. And uh, I was out in the landscape painting uh, from it. And I would get halfway through a painting and realize that I had already painted that painting before. And I would put the brushes down, go over to the um, marsh, um, go down and pick up some oysters and shuck them and eat them. And um, in the evenings, I began to uh, play with um, painting on brochures that I had gotten from the post office and I glued them to canvas. And that was fun for a week or two. And one evening, I didn't much like what was happening on this brochure that was glued to linen canvas. Um, and so I tried to pull the brochure off of the canvas. And the canvas let me keep, let me take some of, of the brochure paper away and kept the rest of it. And the nature of the torn shapes and the fact that I could see the top of the brochure the paper fiber in the interior of of the brochure, I could see the back side of the paper being transferred onto the canvas, and then I could see the raw canvas. I saw right, all right. of these stages coming and going, and that was the most exciting thing I had done on a painting in years. Uh, and I began to do non-objective painting, and for a few years I didn't use paint. I just used torn sanded steel wooled paper uh, on a range of surfaces so, so how did that how did that <clears throat> transform into into going into teaching and mentoring other artists how did you decide that that was going to be your path hmm. uh out of desperation and need uh at first uh i taught as a visiting artist at Stetson University you know, in Florida. And when my uh, term there was up, um, I, I had tried to get full-time full college teaching jobs. And <clears throat> at that time, a middle-aged white male that painted and drew was the last thing that most colleges you know, and universities you were looking for. So I got another you know, visiting artist job, but that was about it. So basically, I made up my mind that if there wasn't a job out there for me, I was going to make one. And so I designed some workshop courses. Uh, people in the Central Florida area knew me really well. Um, so I posted them, and lots of people came, and they worked out well, and I did more, and it slowly uh, built uh, to what it is now. Very shortly after I began teaching those, I realized that maybe I liked this more than college teaching. Uh, no, no committee work, uh, no having to do things the way the department said they needed to be done. Right. So I was really gifted with the opportunity of making the course be exactly what I wanted it to be. Let me add one more thing. <clears throat> people ask me how I uh, learned how to teach. And I always tell people there's a, a bunch of ways, but two big ones. First, I was a bartender in New York City for almost 15 years as an artist. I used to paint and tend bar, you know, three nights a week. But, but as a bartender, you're... Um, in control or you have the task of managing a live group of people and you're in charge. Uh, and so being in front of a group now uh, uh, wasn't uh, awkward at all. Um, and the other thing was um, in New York City in those days, everybody went to therapy and I did as well. <laughs> there was a group. So the therapist I saw also had a group. And I went to group therapy, and I did that for almost 10 years. And so when you spend 10 years in a round table, in a circle, with a group of people talking about feelings um, and about yourself and listening to others do so, that's a natural segue to do the kind of teaching I do. Um, that's amazing, Steve. I don't think I've ever heard that. That is very inspiring, the way you... You really got to get inspired to, you know, go into teaching. 
And I really love people and I really love painting and visual composition. And anybody out there that I encounter who wants to speak the language of visual composition, if they're enthusiastic about it, it doesn't matter what their background is, how much experience they've had, uh, I'm their fan right away. It's really easy for me to be enthusiastic. And <clears throat> it's also easy for me to see people's natural strengths. I can pick up when they have enthusiasms. I can pick up when uh, things are coming out in their work that are strong naturally. And my teaching approach is to recognize those, point them out, um, reinforce them, be enthusiastic about them. And once there's enough trust built up between me and uh, an artist that I'm working with, then I can begin to um, question or challenge the things they do. And, you know, as you know, having been in workshops with me before, <clears throat> you know, the way I do that is to say something like, if this were my painting, and it's not my painting, but if this were my painting and I were sitting in front of it, it would occur, these are the following kinds of things that might occur to me to consider. And then I go through them. And when I'm done going through them, I say, but this is not my painting and you don't need to do any of these things. Um, my approach as a teacher is to never tell somebody what to do if they, or how to do it. I know uh, sometimes only, we, we are looking for you to tell us what to do and yeah. we're looking for you to tell us, okay, obliterate here and keep working here and yeah. finish the painting for me. Yeah. But that doesn't really happen, does it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> and uh, sometimes when I go, this isn't my painting, but if it were my painting, I might think about this, this, and this. It's my indirect way of saying, why don't you try doing that? But I never say it that way. Uh, I just, just open it up as a possibility. Um, I think most people who teach workshops teach a methodology, a technique, um, and people take the workshops to learn that, to learn how to do the technique the way the teacher does or to work in a, in a methodology that's similar to the teacher. And I think those, those kind of workshops are terrific and people learn a ton in those workshops, but it's not, not what I teach. What I teach is uh, there are many ways to go about this, an infinite number of ways to go about making a painting like this. And it's your job to discover your way of doing it. We need your way, not a repeat of mine or a repeat of anybody else's. Uh, <clears throat> when I first moved to Florida years ago, I was asked to jury an outdoor art show, and I did. And I later found out that I juried out many people who always got in, and I juried in some people who rarely got in. And, <clears throat> and I came to realize later that what I was looking for was authenticity, not uh, a skill set. Because there are a lot of people who can render a likeness really well. Uh, if that alone were uh, the criteria to judge a piece of artwork by, then medical illustrators would be in the Guggenheim, but they're not. Uh, it is, there is uh, a connection between the interior of the artist and what manifests itself on a surface. It's that connection or the trueness of that link that rings true. And I, uh, so I think I can recognize that fairly easily. And I think a lot of people can. Yeah. Um, so that's what I look for. Uh, if you don't offer that to yourself, and then if you wish to, to offer it to the world, you don't have anything to offer other than either a repeat of something else or a generic statement. So if a painting behaves according to all of the rules that we know about painting, if it behaves according to all of them, it's a generic painting and doesn't really have very much magic in it. It's when it doesn't quite behave according to all of the rules and it still is deeply satisfying, then you've got something going. I so, agree. Mm -hmm. 
And, um, and usually that magic comes about not by thinking or trying hard, but it comes about by allowing um, and trusting the intelligence that lies in the body and the gut rather than uh, in, in the left brain. And the left brain's a great, uh, you know, a great tool to use occasionally, but the magic never comes from the thinker. The magic always comes from the other place. Krista Harris, who uh, is a terrific artist and teachers also, yeah. did, did a video with me years ago when that book came out. And she talked about um, tapping into, and then she said, that, <clears throat> that pure place. And she pointed to her gut. That pure place. And that's where the magic comes from. Einstein said, uh, the reason we don't have more great scientists is not that we haven't trained them how to think well enough. It's that we haven't uh, trained them to know how and when to stop thinking. He said, every breakthrough, every major breakthrough I've had has come at a moment of no thought. So there's an intelligence that we all have in us that's deeper and richer and stronger than the left brain is. So when you have the, your, your gut feeling, because I know by working with you, you always ask me, what is your gut feeling telling you? Mm -hmm. Follow that. So we <clears throat> all have this sixth sense inside of us. We and we either feel it or we don't. Especially as professional artists, I believe that when we are painting, we have that, you know, that doubt on, in ourselves. Should I continue? Should I stop? Should I hear what my gut is telling me? And then you get a little anxious about hearing it because yes. it might be painting the whole thing white and starting again, which, you know, I do that a lot. Yep. <laughs> <I> and, mean, <laughs> a and, lot. And, uh, you know, de Kooning uh, had paintings in his closet for years and years and years that he did over and over again. So you aren't, aren't alone. Um, you know, I think we all, we all do that. And, and I often tell people in workshops, and you've heard this a million times, but that you hit a point with a painting where it's going <clears throat> pretty well. But it, the question is, is it deeply satisfying you know, enough? And that's the difficult question. When a painting isn't going well, you're in great shape because you know you have to do more stuff to it and you take big chances with it. That's easier than when a painting is going pretty darn well, but maybe not quite well enough. And then you're, um, you know, I tell people you're on uh, the game show, let's make a deal. So here's your painting, you've got it in your hand, you can take it and go home, or you can give it to me, give it up, and then you'll, you'll find out what's behind the unknown, what the unknown is who behind door A, B, and C. And once you give it up, you can't have it back. Right. Of course, in the in the in the digital age, you can do digital art and and keep it and see see what's behind the doors. But uh, um, but that's that's a tough choice to make. But back to the trusting of your gut. Um, when somebody tastes a raw oyster for the first time, and you ask them, "Do you like it or not?" It's usually pretty clear. Yeah, I do. Or uh. -uh never want to taste one of those again and how do we know whether we like it or not uh we we just do it's just a sensation it's an experience and we right away that's a knowledge it's direct experiential knowledge so in a painting if you're tasting it and if you're really present with it and experiencing it and not thinking about it trying to do something to it analyzing it, justifying it, explaining it, if you're not doing any of that stuff. Instead, if you're present with it, then that appetite, that voice knows. So our good friend, uh, Mary Beth Cornelius is asking us, yes. is 90% done good enough? Or is 98%? If it gets to 100, is it perfect or dead? Yeah, those are super questions. And I often say there's, there are no hundreds, but there's a Vermeer or two that I think might be. 
uh, and a Mirandi or two, maybe. But, uh, but otherwise, there aren't any hundreds. And 98s, for me, are very rare occurrences. Every time I've had a show, and I usually have done small paintings, and so a show is 20 paintings or so, uh, usually there are three gems and 17 pretty goods. Uh, the 17 pretty goods are the fillers. Uh, there are never 20 gems. And if I painted a few new paintings that I liked much more deeply than the three that I said were gems in the show, those three that I called gems before would now probably be joined in with the 17 pretty goods. So there's never 20 for me. There's never 20 gems. And so, you know, the number, the grading system is, um, you know, uh, is a 93 where you stop? Is a 95, you know, where you stop? Uh, and uh, every artist has to answer that in their right. own way. One artist in middle 20th century, one non-objective painter said, and I agree with them, if I didn't have to make a living, I could paint on the same painting for the rest of my life. The whole idea of finish is kind of an artifice. If a painting is a living thing, then why kill it? Why say it's dead? Right. Uh, you could paint on it forever. Right. Uh, but we, uh, but that artist said, uh, but I need to make a living. And to make a living, I need more than one surface so I can sell some of them. So I paint many different paintings. Um, the whole judgment about finish has become more and more of an odd idea to me over time um yeah so we have another question for you Shoot. um from a viewer uh yeah. what would you tell aspiring artists hoping to make a living as an artist during this challenging times <laughs> um teach um uh do uh do a separate body of work uh for the purpose of selling and then do another one for yourself. Um, I think you have. I think each artist needs needs to make up their mind. Years ago, I made up my mind not to make a living by by selling paintings. As soon as you you make up your mind that you're going to try to make a living selling paintings, you're either going to be the rare person that's lucky enough that the kind of work they do for themselves happens to be really saleable or you're going to have to begin to consider a little bit what the market is. And when you consider the market, which is fine to do, and some people do it and, and have a great career doing it, but as soon as you begin to consider the market, then you have, uh, you're serving two masters. You're serving you or the art part, and you're serving the audience. Um, so, uh, so what first advice? you need to serve yourself in order to serve others i feel like yes. when i paint at least um when i feel satisfied enough i feel that i can then translate that into satisfying somebody else's view because i am satisfied i'm happy with what i have so then i have my energy that i'm transferring into somebody else so i do believe that there is something um when we finish our painting that is speaking to us um, and we are feeling it in our gut. And then, um, because I do a lot of commission work and so my commission work, um, sometimes, you know, I have to think of what my clients really want, but I will not sell ever a piece that I'm not 100% satisfied with and happy with it. I rather never sell that. I will never push something that I personally don't love. And so, and do you need to make a living off of um, sales of paintings? That is, if you don't sell any more paintings, you're going to not have anything to eat? No. Okay. So your sales of paintings are important, but not vital. Because if you needed to eat off of sales of your paintings, you would have to put, put work out there no matter what your Agreed. interior Agreed. is like. I am very fortunate that I have food in my table and that I can, you know, do this kind of work that I do. So 
uh, in that sense, I am incredibly grateful for what I have. Um, another question that I have for you is for people, what we're trying to do here, like I, I explained before in this interviews, is really to inspire and to teach um, people at home that they can really do anything with whatever kind of materials they have at home. Um, so if you had like some lessons to teach us on non-objective art, what really is non-objective art? That's a super question. It's a great question. And different people would probably give you differing answers to it, but I can tell you what my answers are. Um, he, he, non-objective painting, uh, well, let's, let's f first talk about other kinds of painting and what they are. So realism uh, is an attempt, has as its primary purpose to create the, the illusion of seeing something on that canvas the way we see it when we look out here. Right. Um, and realist paintings are frozen paintings. So to paint a picture of that, you have to... Uh, pick out a portion of it, freeze yourself in one place, and describe it from one point of view at one moment frozen in time. <clears throat> Abstraction, to me, is when you, and all uh, realistic paintings are abstracted, uh, but abstract painting when it really becomes more, more abstract is when you begin with a reference like that and then you edit it, alter it, distill it, rearrange it, modify it, uh, simplify it, all of those kinds of things so that you change it in order to express a feeling. Uh, but, but it still is working from a reference that you respond to. Non-objective painting doesn't begin with a reference out there at all. Uh, it isn't an abstraction. It is a concrete thing. Uh, a non-objective painting is not a picture of something. It's something you can take a picture of, but it's not a picture of something. Um, further, most representational painting and narrative painting is something that you can attempt to understand and the artist making it often has something they want to convey that is understandable, knowable. A non-objective painting is about realities that are invisible, uh, internal, um, and um, so it's not something that you can understand. You know, non-objective paintings are experiences to have rather than things to understand um people so for people at home they can they can start by making marks which we would call you know activating a painting of some sort so they can really would be able to start something um with no judgment people at home who haven't done this before uh, the most natural thing to do is, is collage. If Rembrandt had stacks of People magazine in his living room and Elmer's glue, I'm sure it would have occurred to him to begin cutting it up and pasting it into arrangements. In Rembrandt's day, paper was so precious that they would have never thought of doing such a thing. Right. But in collage, a person who's never painted before does it, can do it without having to learn how to mix colors, without having to learn how to handle a brush, without having to learn any of those skills. It's pure okay. visual composition that anybody can do and learn from. So to me, that's the most direct and easiest way to access this. Uh, painting is, uh, and I do it, and you all do it, and it's a glorious thing to do, but painting is only one uh, medium, only one avenue through which to get to this language. And a lot of people have felt, although it's not true, but a lot of people have argued that painting is an old-fashioned, outdated um, form of, of expression. To take animal hair 
and wrap it around the end of a stick and take colored dust and put it in cooking oil and smush the colored dust and oil around on a piece of cloth. That's uh, compared to the tools we have now. Uh, that's so so outdated and primitive that why would you do it? Uh, right. I, of course, uh, love doing it, and I think people always will do it. I think the painting process forces us to slow down, be present, and make choices uh, from a self-awareness. And I don't think you get that as easily from doing other forms of art. And I think abstraction, I, I think you know, non-objective painting is about things in us and in the world that we cannot see, that we cannot know, but are real and important. And we want to express our feelings about them. And the bet, the only thing we can do is take a shot at it, you know, non-objective. Right. It's poetry. It's metaphor. It's not, you can't, it, it's not a straightforward telling something. It's uh, giving somebody the experience that uh, gives them a sensation, a hint. I mean, if you look up at these trees, uh, well, I don't know how this is doing here, but if you look up at this, uh, even, and even as I'm moving a little bit, you know, uh, the, the only way to begin to express that by rendering is to be a cubist. That is to take a fragment of one part of the experience and a fragment of another part and a fragment of another part and put them together as a composite because that's the way we walk around in the world. We don't freeze and stand still. And I don't ask you to freeze and stand still. We're moving, we're changing, we're in flux, everything's alive. And so the cubists were uh, radical in that they proposed you could you could convey a range of experiences of different things over time all in the same canvas at the same time right um, and so that was one of the the most profound abstractions uh, most profound but I, I love what you just said about you know how it can be poetic it can be energizing it can be you know, a sensation that you've never felt before. And it is really incredible how you are expressing um, your, your way, your language is really speaking to all of us. And um, I'm actually going to ask you for a part two, um, because we can talk forever and ever and ever. And there's so much interest um, in this subject. So I would love to continue this and you and I will find another time, hopefully, um, to have a part two on this. And um, I would love for you to tell us where we can find you um, for people that um, have more questions or want to approach you. Um, where can we find you, Steve? Uh, you can, uh, I've got a private Facebook page, uh, you know, a personal Facebook page and I'm on it often. Okay. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I guess it's Steve and I'm an e. um, I've got a website. I've got two or three websites. Um, you can go to which Andrew I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that our audience, um, will, um, know about you. And, um, I'm telling you all the comments that I'm seeing, they all are hungry for part two. So, um, <laughs> We, we shall continue, my friend. This well, I just want to show you one thing. I've got yes, a please do. table please outside do. here. Yes. I don't know if you can see it, but I've got yes. my drawing book and Oh, please show uh, us. Please catalog. Show us. We, have no, we don't have anywhere to go, so please show well, us. You'll have a catalog of works by the, um, uh, is it 33 women artists? It's going to use oh, yeah. that as a way to talk about uh, painting and I've got images from uh, the drawing book. Uh, oh, that's so terrific! I've, I've got, so I've let's got... do on let's do that on part two. Yeah, sounds good. I would love it. Thank you so 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 much. Really, you well, have inspired everyone, and um, we will a hundred percent do this again. 
and we'll go into more focus work on the catalogs and everything that you have to offer us because I think there's a big need right now for people that want to learn and want to be engaged and want to continue to be inspired and um you inspired me so hopefully i'm inspiring others and this is an incredible community that we have it, and we just need it to is. use it it's uh really terrific and i really thank you for doing this because this helps keep it alive and, and even extend it uh and at a time like this with everybody being at home uh these kinds of connections are more important you know than ever i'm i'm actually teaching uh an online individual study workshop right now that i opened up to people that took uh the workshops here in montreat and the last one in maine uh but i'm going to probably do some more of them uh so if people have an interest in that keep an eye out for a yeah, post to, for or sure. just, just yeah. email me your interest yeah. Yeah. I will for sure make sure that everybody knows your information and we will have maybe a part two, a part three, a part four. We'll see. We shall see. You are fabulous, my friend, and I can't uh, thank you enough for everything and um, we'll be in touch. And I just want to say to everyone, thank you for joining us this morning and being patient with me and Steve this <laughs> at the earlier part of it that we couldn't get Steve on. But Thankfully, we did, and this was incredible. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone. Thank and you. we will see you on Wednesday with our next guest artist, Renda Separito. So I can't wait to be with her and, uh, and uh, on, on, ongoing inspiration, right, Steve? Uh, yes, and uh, make sure to have Renda talk about uh, uh, always having, wanting to create uh, an equilibrium between the pretty and the gritty. Uh, I sure will, because yeah, she right. has that line. I will for sure make sure that she talks about that. Okay. Take care. Thank you, Sandra. Have a beautiful day. Thank you, everybody. Day. Take care. Bye-bye.